Welcome to the Tech Meme Ride Home for Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. I'm Brian McCullough. Today, FireEye says it got hacked by a nation state. Microsoft's cloud gaming is coming to iOS in the spring. Samsung's Unpacked event is coming in about a month, and we've already got plenty of leaks about the phones we expect to see. Is Apple's self-driving project still on track? And if you feel like you've been getting more spam calls this year, while maybe rents in San Francisco have been plummeting, I'm here to tell you neither of those trends seem to be imaginary. Here's what you missed today in the world of tech. If you're a regular listener of this podcast, then you should know the name FireEye. They're the cybersecurity firm that it seems like I quote from half the time when there's a major hack or security story in the world. Well, FireEye is the security story today because they say some of their internal systems were hacked by nation-state actors, compromising its red team tools, which FireEye uses to test the defenses of thousands of customers, quoting the Wall Street Journal. FireEye declined to comment on who it believed was behind the breach of its hacking tools, which experts said could potentially be leveraged in future attacks against its customer base, including a diverse array of U.S. and Western national security agencies and businesses. A person familiar with the matter said Russia is currently seen by investigators, including U.S. intelligence agencies, as the most likely culprit, but stressed that the investigation was continuing. Moscow's foreign intelligence service, known as the SVR, and one of two Russian groups that hacked the Democratic National committee ahead of the 2016 presidential election is believed to be responsible, the person said. The Russian embassy didn't immediately respond to a request for comment. Quote, I've concluded we are witnessing an attack by a nation with top-tier offensive capabilities, Kevin Mandia, the chief executive at FireEye and a former Air Force officer, said in a blog post published Tuesday. The attackers tailored their world-class capabilities specifically to target and attack FireEye, end quote. FireEye, a company that has in years past helped businesses respond to some of the most serious hacks on record, such as the 2014 hack of Sony Pictures by North Korea, said it was working with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and industry partners, including Microsoft, in a continuing investigation into the incident. FireEye shares dropped about 7% in after-hours trading, end quote. Microsoft says its cloud gaming service part of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, will come to iOS via web browser in the spring of 2021, quoting 9to5Mac. This was first rumored in October. Microsoft had decided not to launch its game streaming service on iOS because of the App Store guidelines. Bringing cloud gaming to the iPhone and iPad via the web browser will allow Microsoft to skirt the App Store guidelines altogether, quoting from Microsoft's blog post. Expanding Xbox to new players is central to our ambition of helping games and developers find an easy path to the world's 3 billion gamers. We are doing this by embracing multiple devices and providing a consistent Xbox experience wherever you log in, whether that's on your Xbox Series X or S, PC, Xbox One, Android device, or starting in spring 2021, your Windows PC and iOS device from the cloud, end quote. Microsoft does note that cloud gaming on iOS via the web will technically be a beta at first, but no further details are provided. Note that this is also different than what's available in the Xbox app, which allows Xbox console owners to stream games directly from their personal console, end quote. Google says it is opening up its open-source Fuchsia OS to outside developers, the first formal announcement of the project Google has ever made, quoting 9to5Google. For almost as long as it's been in development, Fuchsia has been open source, meaning anyone can view and download the necessary source code to build the OS for themselves. In fact, last year, Google quietly launched an official Fuchsia.dev website, teaching developers how best to work on Fuchsia and, to a much lesser extent, how to make Fuchsia apps. All throughout the last four years, however, Fuchsia has been something of a skunkworks project with Google remaining surprisingly quiet about its purpose. That changes today as the company is making something of a splash with Fuchsia on the Google open source blog, opening a call for developers to contribute to the project. In fact, this is the first formal announcement of the Fuchsia operating system's existence and how Google plans to use it. Quoting from the blog post, Fuchsia is a long-term project to create a general-purpose open-source operating system, and today we are expanding Fuchsia's open-source model to welcome contributions from the public. 
Fuchsia is designed to prioritize security, updatability, and performance, and is currently under active development by the Fuchsia team. We have been developing Fuchsia in the open in our Git repository for the last four years. You can browse the repository history at fuchsia.googlesource.com to see how Fuchsia has evolved over time. We are laying the foundation from the kernel up to make it easier to create long-lasting, secure products and experiences." End quote. To support developers and make the Fuchsia development process less skunkworks and more public, Google is opening Fuchsia's bug tracker to the public. Just like Android and Chromium, Fuchsia now even has public mailing lists for those who want to be aware of major changes. If you want to contribute code, there's also a formal process to become a member of the Fuchsia project. More importantly for both interested developers and the general public, Google now has a public roadmap for Fuchsia's development." End quote. Mark your calendars for the new year because the rumors are that Samsung's annual Unpacked event will take place on January 14th. Not only that, it seems that official marketing teasers for the Galaxy S21, S21 Plus, and S21 Ultra, the exact devices we expect to debut at this event, have all apparently leaked online. Quoting Android Police. Pictured below, we have the Samsung Galaxy S21 5G in Phantom Violet. Up front, we get a peek at the flat display with centered hole-punch cam and minimal front bezel. The frame of the phone extends up around the side of the camera bump for a very distinctive look that's fast becoming the S21's calling card. That camera bump houses a triple camera setup with a 12-megapixel main sensor, 12-megapixel ultra-wide, and 64-megapixel telephoto. Samsung sets the flash off to the right of that package on the violet glass stick back. The exposed body portions of the phone will be bronze, contrasting the violet color. Samsung's Galaxy S21 Plus 5G looks pretty much exactly the same as the S21 5G. The color, overall design, and camera setup matches what we'll see from the S21. The differences here will manifest in boost to screen size and battery capacity. The Galaxy S21 Ultra is where the design changes start cropping up. The S21 Ultra will get a curved screen instead of the flat-edged glass of its smaller siblings. Along with that, the Galaxy S21 Ultra will have a quad camera system instead of the triple camera on the S21 and S21+. Plus. We can see a single periscope cam with 10 megapixel 10x super telephoto zoom alongside the 108 megapixel main sensor, 12 megapixel ultra wide and 12 megapixel 3x telephoto cameras. There's also a laser autofocus system at the top, replacing the TOF sensor of the S20 Ultra, end quote. On top of predicting that the unpacked event will happen January 14th, Android Police's sources say that retail availability of these new phones will be later that month, January 29. They also think that pricing will come in slightly cheaper than the previous generation, which is always welcome. All right, they're officially starting to go out the door. DoorDash began trading today after its IPO at a price of $102, thereby raising $3.37 billion for the company, valuing the company at $38 billion. But at the time of this writing, once trading began, its price has risen to $182 a share, a greater than 75% rise over its IPO price, so a plenty healthy first day pop. At about noon Eastern, DoorDash was trading around $155 to $160 per share, so suggesting a market cap of $60 billion plus. Quite good in terms of cresting the wave of investor sentiment. Airbnb is on deck for tomorrow. Wish should debut next week, then Affirm and Roblox later this month, but before the holidays, I would assume. Froth. It's great on top of your pumpkin spice latte, but it's not great in your investment portfolio. If you've been watching the stock market lately, there's been enough froth to fill a stadium of venti macchiatos. The S&P is trading over 37 times earnings. The top five tech stocks are up over 50% this year, but the rest of the index is only up 5%. 
Not a great setup if you're looking for diversity. So how do you avoid the froth while preserving your net worth? Do what I recently did and open up an account with Masterworks to diversify your portfolio by getting into art. Blue Chip Art outperformed the S&P by 180% from 2000 to 2018, with almost no correlation to the stock market. Masterworks.io is the only platform that lets you invest in art from artists like Banksy, Cause, and Murakami. Masterworks.io is making investing in art as easy as buying stocks online at a fraction of the cost. Just recently, Masterworks.io sold their first Banksy masterpiece for a 32% return, double the S&P over that same time time period. Due to recent demand, the waitlist to invest on Masterworks.io is over 20,000 people, but Tech Meme Ride Home listeners can skip the waitlist by going to Masterworks.io and entering promo code RIDE. Again, that's Masterworks.io promo code RIDE. See important information at Masterworks.io slash disclaimer. You know what makes this time of year truly wonderful? It's the music. And I'm getting my holiday music fix with Amazon Music. I've actually been an Amazon Music user since I got my first Echo. What was that? Six years ago now? It literally is the best for doing simple things like asking Alexa to just play some holiday music. No need to make playlists, no need to search albums, no need to do anything. Haven't tried Amazon Music before for yourself? For a limited time, you can get your first three months of Amazon Music Unlimited for free. That's access to more than 70 million songs on demand and ad-free. Play the songs you want, when you want, free for three months. You could play Mariah on repeat all day long, all the way into 2021, if that's your jam. Listen at home or wherever you are. Your holidays will be merrier with fun, festive tunes. Remember, for a limited time, new subscribers can get three months of Amazon Music Unlimited for free. Go to Amazon.com slash Ride Home. That's Amazon.com slash Ride Home to get your first three months of Amazon Music free. Starts at $7.99 per month after that. New subscribers only. Terms apply. Offer expires January 11th, 2021. Cupertino Kremlinology time with Uber cutting bait on its self-driving tech. Wither Apple's foray into this area. Sources are telling Mark Gurman that Bob Mansfield has officially retired from Apple for good this time which is interesting because, remember, he had been dissuaded from a previous retirement attempt, we think, to keep charge of Apple's self-driving project. Well, Gurman says AI chief John Gianandrea is now in charge of Project Titan, the self-driving project at Apple, with Doug Field running day-to-day operations on the project, reporting directly to Gianandrea, quoting Gurman in Bloomberg. Previously, Field reported to Bob Mansfield, Apple's former senior vice president of hardware engineering. Mansfield has now fully retired from Apple, leading to Gian Andrea taking over. Mansfield initially retired from Apple in 2012, only to return for less than a year as its senior vice president in charge of chip technology. Mansfield stepped down from that role in 2013 and then remained as a part-time consultant. In 2014, Apple set out to build an autonomous electric car to take on Tesla and other manufacturers, only to pare back its ambitions around 2016. The project was struggling with direction, leadership, and technical challenges, Bloomberg reported at the time, and Apple brought back Mansfield to lead the effort. Mansfield oversaw a shift from the development of a car to just the underlying autonomous system. In 2017, Apple Chief Executive Officer Tim Cook told Bloomberg that the autonomous systems effort was, quote, the mother of all AI projects and, quote, a core technology that we view as very important. He also described it as, quote, probably one of the most difficult AI projects to work on, end quote. Since then, Apple has cut some workers from the project, but continues its development. In the past, the company has weighed launching its own car, building the self-driving system for auto manufacturing partners, or designing an aftermarket kit that works with multiple different cars, the people said, end quote. German also says that Apple continues to test their vehicles on California roads with a fleet of 66 test vehicles as of right now, according to the California DMV, up from a fleet of 55 a year ago. I believe I told you a couple times this year that it was shaping up to be a banner year for European startups, at least in terms of attracting VC funding. And indeed, according to an Atomico report, European tech startups are on track to receive a record $41 billion in VC funding in 2020, driven by fintech and SaaS startups. Quote, 
The success of 2020 has been driven by the increase in 100 to $250 million mega rounds. The top 10 largest rounds alone raised $4.1 billion, equivalent to 16% of capital invested in Europe in the first nine months of 2020. The companies which raised those mega rounds came from all corners of the continent. Sweden's Klarna and Northvolt, the UK's Revolut, Karma Kitchen and Kazoo, Germany's Auto One Group, Lilium and Tier, France's Miracal, and Romania's UiPath. But in comparison to the U.S., European investment at $41 billion remains low, five times less than North America's $141 billion for the year. Still, the continent continues to catch up with Asia, which at $74 billion invested in 2020 is some way behind the $117 billion for 2018, mostly due to the continued decline of investment into Chinese private tech companies, end quote. Speaking of, here's an interesting raise. Wikifactory has raised $4.5 million for its so-called GitHub for Hardware, which aims to allow you to make almost anything remotely, quoting TechCrunch. With the investment, the company will build a quality-assured manufacturing marketplace, as well as mirrored servers in China to open up access to its hardware capital, Shenzhen. Wikifactory is available in four languages right now and is set to expand to 20 after it raised a Series A funding round last year. In addition, its new collaborative CAD tool with inbuilt chat means designers, engineers, manufacturers, and enterprises can collaborate remotely on virtually any CAD model from concept through to finished prototype. This allows product developers to review and discuss 3D models in over 30 file formats in real time. The idea is to democratize access to normally expensive product lifecycle management or PLM software. The startup says that since May 2019, some 70,000 product developers in 190 countries have been using Wikifactory to build robotics, electric vehicles and drones, agritech and sustainable energy appliances, lab equipment and 3D printers, smart furniture and biotech fashion materials, as well as medical supplies, including vital PPE and ventilators, when there were global supply shortages, end quote. If you felt like you got more spam calls than ever this year, True Collar says you're not imagining it. According to them, 31.3 billion spam calls were received between January and October this year, up 18% year over year. That's the global total, but also the average American gets 28.4 spam calls a month, up from 18.2 year over year. Quoting TechCrunch. With 49.9 spam calls per user a month, up from an already alarming 45.6 figure last year, Brazil remained the worst impacted nation by spam calls, the firm said in its yearly report on the subject. Quote, The COVID-19 pandemic has directly and indirectly affected not only global economies and societies, but spammer behavior as well. As the virus spread exponentially worldwide, spam calls started to decrease around March, said Truecaller, which analyzed over 145 billion anonymous calls to reach its conclusions. Spam reached its lowest point in April when strict curfews and lockdowns were implemented worldwide. The overall volume of calls also dipped during this period. However, from that point, reports of scammers taking advantage of the uncertainty around the pandemic emerged. In May, spam calls started to pick up again and have been increasing on average by 9.7% per month. October, with a record high in terms of spam calls, was 22.4% higher than the pre-lockdown period. In addition to bringing annoyance, these calls are also being used to scam people out of money. As many as 56 million Americans reported having lost money to phone scams this year, and an estimated $19.7 billion was lost to such calls, according to an earlier True Color report, end quote. Finally today, if you're also feeling like rents in San Francisco have been dropping because people either can now work from home and are thus moving to work from wherever they want, and or folks are actually fleeing the Bay Area because Silicon Valley is over, you're not imagining that either. In San Francisco, quoting Bloomberg, the median rent for a studio apartment dropped 35% last month from a year earlier to $2,100, while costs for one-bedrooms were down 27% to 2716 according to data set to be released this week from Realtor.com. 
The declines are steepening from earlier in the pandemic, a sign that people with the flexibility to move are leaving an area that is still among America's priciest for housing. San Francisco stands to be among the U.S. cities most affected by the trends brought on by COVID-19, even as much of the industry that drives its wealth thrives. While many New York finance firms are pushing for people to return to the office, tech companies are more fully embracing remote work, raising the prospect of a longer-term transformation of an area known as much for its expensive real estate and devastating inequality as for its beauty and offbeat character. Some companies are taking steps to scale back office space, a sign the virus upheaval won't be temporary. San Francisco's office vacancy rate has roughly doubled this year to 8.3%, driving asking rents down almost 9%, according to real estate firm CBRE. Earlier this year, Pinterest shelled out almost $90 million to terminate its lease in a new downtown tower because it is, quote, rethinking where future employees could be based in a post-COVID era. Housing startup Opendoor paid $5.2 million to end its downtown lease early, a regulatory filing showed, end quote. So if you're already a tech industry worker in good standing and you're in San Francisco right now, you might be taking that as a trend signal that says that the boom times in San Francisco are over. But if you're a young, hungry, aspiring denizen of Silicon Valley, you might conversely take this news as a signal that your dreams of coming out to California to make your mark in the valley just got significantly more affordable. So the rumors all day have been that around the time this reaches your ears, about 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the FTC and 40-plus state attorneys general are going to file antitrust lawsuits against Facebook, alleging the Instagram and WhatsApp purchases were made to kill competition. I considered holding the show until those announcements were made, but then again, most of the analysis of any lawsuits that get filed would happen overnight anyway, so I decided to just wait until tomorrow so we could dive into all of that. But this is me at least letting you know that this news has happened, or probably has happened. At the time of this writing, it hasn't happened yet, but by the time you hear these words, it probably has. Again, producing this show is like living in a literal time machine. Talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.